Argument number 8. Their festivals, fasts, and religious rites have also a great resemblance to those of the Hebrews. It will be necessary here to take a short view of the principal Jewish feasts. They kept every year a sacred feast called the Passover in memory of their deliverance from Egyptian bondage. Seven days were appointed Leviticus. Xie. Dash to these they added an eighth through religious principle as preparatory to clear their houses of all leaven and to fix their minds before they entered on that religious duty. The name of this festival is derived from a word which signifies to pass over because when the destroying angel flew through the Egyptian houses and killed the firstborn, he passed over those of the Israelites, the tops of whose doors were stained with the blood of the lamb which they were ordered to kill. This solemnity was instituted with the strongest injunctions to let their children know the cause of that observance and to mark that night through all their generations. Three days before this sacred festival, they chose a lamb without spot or blemish and killed it on the evening of the 14th day of Abib, which was the first moon of the ecclesiastical and the seventh of the civil year, and they ate it with bitter herbs without breaking any of the bones of it, thus prefiguring the death of Messiah. This was the reason that this were the chief of the days of unleavened bread, and they were strictly forbidden all manner of work on that day, besides, no uncircumcised or unclean persons ate of the paschal lamb. Those of the people whom diseases or long journeys prevented them from observing the Passover on that day, were obliged to keep it on the next moon. On the fifteenth day, which was the second of the Passover, they offered up to God a sheaf of the new barley harvest, because it was the earliest grain. The priest carried it into the temple, and having cleaned and parked it, he ground or pounded it into flour, dipped it in oil, and then waved it before the Lord, throwing some into the fire. The Jews were forbidden to eat any of their new harvests, till they had offered up a sheaf, the grain of which filled an omer, a small measure of about five pints. All were impure and unholy till this oblation was made, but afterwards, it became hallowed, and everyone was at liberty to reap and get in his harvest. On the tenth day of the moon Nephanim, the first day of the civil year, they celebrated the great fast, or feast of expiation, afflicted their souls, and ate nothing the whole day. The high priest offered several sacrifices, and having carried the blood of the victims into the temple, he sprinkled it upon the altar of incense and the veil that was before the holiest, and went into that most sacred place, where the divine Shekinah resided, carrying a censer smoking in his hand with incense, which hindered him from having a clear sight of the ark. But he was not allowed to enter that holy place, only once a year, on this great day of expiation, to offer the general sacrifice both for the sins of the people and of himself. Nor did he ever mention the divine four-lettered name, Yohiwah, except on this great day, when he blessed the people. Because the Israelites lived in tabernacles, or booths, while they were in the wilderness, as a memorial therefore of the divine bounty to them, they were commanded to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, on the fifteenth day of the month, Tisri, which they called Rosh Hashanah, or Hashiana, it lasted eight days, during which time, they lived in arbors, covered with green boughs of trees, unless when they went to worship at the temple, or sung Hoshani around the altar. When they were on this religious duty, they were obliged each to carry in their hands a bundle of the branches of woolers, palm trees, myrtles, and others of different sorts, laden with fruit, and tied together with ribbons, and thus rejoice together with the appointed singers, and vocal and instrumental music, in the divine presence before the altar. On the eighth day of the feast, one of the priests brought some water in a golden vessel, from the pool of Siloam, mixed it with wine, and poured it on the morning sacrifice, and the first fruits of the latter crops which were then presented, as an emblem of the divine graces that should flow to them, when Shiloh came, who was to be their anointed king, prophet, and high priest the people in the meantime, singing out of his ear, with joy, shall he draw water out of the wells of salvation. Close quote let us now turn to the copper color, American Hebrews. Dash while the sanctified new fruits are dressing, a religious attendant is ordered to call six of their old beloved women to come to the temple and dance the beloved dance with joyful hearts, according to the old beloved speech. They cheerfully obey and enter the supposed holy ground in solemn procession, each carrying in her hand a bundle of small branches of various green trees, and they join the same number of old Magi, or priests, who carry a cane in one hand adorned with white feathers, having likewise green boughs in their other hand, which they pull from their holy arbor and carefully place there, encircling it with several rounds. Those beloved men have their heads dressed with white plumes, but the women are decked in their finest and anointed with bear's grease, having small tortoise shells and white pebbles fastened to a piece of white dressed deer skin which is tied to each of their legs. The eldest of the priests leads the sacred dance ahead of the innermost row, which of course is next to the holy fire. 
he begins the dance around the supposed holy fire by invoking Yah after the usual manner on a bass key and with a short accent, then he sings yo-yo, which is repeated by the rest of the religious procession, and he continues his sacred invocations and praises, repeating the divine word or notes till they return to the same point of the circular course where they began. Then he in like manner and wah wah. While dancing they never fail to repeat those notes, and frequently the holy train strike up Hallelu, Hallelu, then Hallelujah, Hallelujah, and Hallelujah and Hallelujah, a radiation to the divine essence close quote, with great earnestness and fervor, till they encircle the altar, while each strikes the ground with right and left feet alternately, very quick, but well timed. Then the awful drums join the sacred choir, which incite the old female singers to chant forth their pious notes and grateful praises before the divine essence, and to redouble their former quick joyful steps, in imitation of the leader of the sacred dance and the religious men ahead of them. What with the manly strong notes of the one and the shrill voices of the other, in concert with the beat shells and the two sounding drum-like curtain vessels, with the voices of the musicians who beat them, the reputed holy grand echoes with the praises of Yohiwa. Their singing and dancing in three circles around their sacred fire appears to have a reference to a like religious custom of the Hebrews. And may we not reasonably suppose that they formally understood the Psalms or divine hymns. At least does that begin with Hallelujah, otherwise, how came all the inhabitants of the extensive regions of North and South America to have and retain those very expressive Hebrew words? Or how repeat them so distinctly and apply them after the manner of the Hebrews in their religious acclamations? like cannot be found in any other countries. In like manner, they sing on other religious occasions and at their feasts of love, Elio Elio, which is due, the divine name, by his attribute of omnipotence, and you grave, alluding to you grave o circumflex o tilde o circumflex. They sing likewise hua hua, which is o circumflex o tilde o circumflex the immortal soul drawn from the divine essential name, as deriving its rational faculties from Yahua. Those words that they sing in their religious dances, they never repeat at any other time, which seems to have greatly occasioned the loss of the meaning of their divine hymns, for I believe they are now so corrupt as not to understand either the spiritual or literal meaning of what they sing any further than by allusion. In their circuiting dances, they frequently sing on a bass key, alu alu, alu alu, and alu alu, which is the Hebrew du. They likewise sing shulu yo, shulu yo, shulu he, shulu he, shulu wa, shulu wa, and shulu ha, shulu ha. They transpose them also several ways, but with the very same notes. The three terminations make up in their order the four-lettered divine name. Har is a note of gladness the word preceding it, shilu, seems to express the predicted human and divine you, shilo, who was to be the purifier and peacemaker. They continue their grateful divine hymns for the space of 15 minutes, when the dance breaks up. As they degenerate, they lengthen their dances, and shorten the time of their fasts and purifications, in some age, that they have so exceedingly corrupted their primitive rites and customs, within the space of the last 30 years, that, at the same rate of declension, there will not be long the possibility of tracing their origin, but by their dialects and war customs. At the end of this notable religious dance, the old beloved or holy women return home to hasten the feast of the new sanctified fruits. In the meanwhile, everyone at the temple drinks very plentifully of the cassina and other bitter liquids to cleanse their sinful bodies, after which they go to some convenient deep water, and there, according to the ceremonial law of the Hebrews, they wash away their sins with water. Thus sanctified, they return with joyful hearts in solemn procession, singing the notes of praise, till they enter into the holy ground to eat of the new delicious fruits of wild C-A-N-A-N-X-X-I-I-I. Women now with the utmost cheerfulness, bring to the outside of the sacred square, a plentiful variety of all those good things, with which the divine fire has blessed them in the new year, and the religious attendants lay it before them, according to their stated order and reputed merit. Every seat is served in a gradual succession, from the white and red imperial long broad seats, and the whole square is soon covered. Frequently they have a change of courses of 50 or 60 different sorts, and thus they continue to regale themselves, to the end of the festival, for they reckon they are now to feast themselves with joy and gladness, as the divine fire is appeased for past crimes, and has propitiously sanctified their weighty harvest. They all behave so modestly, and are possessed of such an extraordinary constancy and equanimity, in the pursuit of the religious mysteries, that they do not show the least outward emotion of pleasure, at the first sight of the sanctified new fruits, nor the least uneasiness to be tasting those tempting delicious fat things of canon. 
If one of them acted in a contrary manner, they would say to him, Chi Haxat Kaniha, you resemble such as were beating cannon. Close quote this unconcern, doubtless proceeded originally from a virtuous principle, but now, it may be the mere effect of habit. For, jealousy and revenge excepted, they seem to be divested of every mental passion, and entirely incapable of any lasting affection.